Thank you for the introduction. Here's the motivation. Uh, in inductive synthesis, we start with a set of input of examples and generate a program that satisfies the examples. A problem here is that the examples often under-specify the program behavior and that they're not necessarily easier to write than the program. So instead of using input output examples, we now use a program as the specification. Now we are no longer restricted by the examples that the user manually writes. Instead, we can generate whatever inputs we need. We can use active learning to eliminate uncertainty. In this research, we produce a unique equivalent class of programs that satisfy the chosen input behavior. Now this problem is no longer program synthesis, but more about inference and regeneration. When we talk to people about this research, they often ask the question, if you already have a program, why synthesize another one that does the same thing? There are many good answers. We can migrate an existing program to new platforms or languages. We can write a simple program, then augment it for more complicated platforms. We can reverse engineer a program when the source code is unavailable or obfuscated. We can rewrite an overly engineered legacy program with the simple core functionality. So for all of these use cases, it sounds like we are treating the entire program as a black box. But to work more productively in practice, we now treat the program as a gray box. With a gray box, we know that there are uh, multiple components in there, and then we observe the traffic between them. So we observe the component interactions during the program execution, in addition to the final outputs. In this paper, we deal with data retrieval apps. Here's a program that accesses an external database. The user runs the program from interfaces like command line arguments or HTTP requests. When the program runs, it sends SQL queries to the database, which then retrieves the data as requested. There are many applications that fall into this category. For many of them, the implementation is complicated because people often use heavy frameworks, but their core functionality may be relatively simple. So these properties make this domain a great target for our research. For many of these apps, they contain multiple commands that each access different parts of the database. And in this research, we infer each of the commands one at a time. Here's an example program. It has a command that retrieves student registration records. It has two input parameters, S and P, which represent ID and password. It uses four database tables, student, teachers, courses, and registration. The program first looks up the student. If the student exists, it then looks up the password. If the password, if the password matches, it then retrieves the registration records for the student. So in this program and many other data retrieval apps, there's an interesting pattern. The data flow often manifests as SQL queries. And the control flow largely depends on the query results. What this means is that if we observe the database queries during the program execution, we can potentially learn a lot about the program. And that's what we do. Our tool is called Conyer. It is named after a kind of parrot. Before we start, we take the input parameter format and the database schema from the user. With that information, we populate the database with chosen values, and we run the program with chosen inputs. When the program runs, we use a transparent proxy outside of the database to intercept the traffic. After the program terminates, we also collect the outputs. We repeat this interaction multiple times, and eventually we infer the program and regenerate a new one that does the same thing. Obviously, it is not a good idea to try to solve this problem in the most general form. So let me walk you through some of the problems and solutions so that we are on the same page. 
if a program looks like this, then an inference algorithm would need to enumerate all the possible inputs until it, it fi finds out that the program sometimes does A instead of B, and that would be infeasible. We also want to avoid generating a solution like this, which simply records all the inputs and displays the outputs. This is a bad solution because it doesn't generalize to new inputs. So to solve these problems, we use a domain-specific language to precisely capture the programs that we can infer. The DSL is designed to rule out uninferable programs and to rule out the degenerate solutions. We designed the DSL and the inference algorithm together. The DSL sh needs to be restrictive enough so that if the program is in the DSL, then, it is, uh, then our algorithm guarantees to infer it correctly and precisely. The DSL also needs to be expressive enough so that it actually captures some applications of practical interest. So striking a balance between these two goals is an interesting challenge in this research. In this paper, we, uh, our DSL supports data retrieval apps that have the patterns that I described earlier. Specifically, there are two key components in the DSL. The first key component is the query. Each statement performs a query. A query can select from the tables the rows that satisfy an expression. The query retrieves the data and stores it in the variable, and the variable can later be referenced in the program. A query expression may re reference retrieved data, reference input parameters, or compare columns, and we talk about them in the paper. The other key component of the DSL is the control flow. The control flow is directly tied to the query results. We allow two kinds of control logic. An if statement first performs a query to retrieve the data, and then if there's non if it retrieves non-empty data, then it enters the then branch, otherwise the else branch. A for loop first performs a query to retrieve data, and if there's non-empty data, it performs the loop body once for each row. If there's no data, then it enters the else branch. There are complications with dependency and reachability, and we deal with them in the paper. Because we directly tie the control flow to the queries and their results, we can observe the control flow just by looking at the database traffic. We can also force the program to execute down a certain path by populating the database with carefully chosen values so that certain queries retrieve certain numbers of rows. Let's look at the inference algorithm. Conceptually, there are two things we need to infer. From the concrete SQL queries, we need to infer the abstract query templates with variable references. We deal with this part in the paper. From the unstructured sequence of queries in the trace, we need to infer the underlying control flow of the program. And I'll focus on this part. In the algorithm, we maintain a hypothesis of what we currently know about the program. And the hypothesis is represented as a sentential form in the DSL. For example, here are some potential hypotheses. Here, prog is a non-terminal symbol in the DSL. The algorithm is going to resolve each of the prog non-terminal symbols by applying the appropriate production. For a concrete e example, let's infer the student registration program. The initial hypothesis is prog, which means that we currently don't know anything about the program except that it belongs to our DSL. There are four potential ways to expand prog. It can either be epsilon, which is an empty program, or it can be seek if or for non-terminal symbol. We first run the program with some initial inputs where the parameters are distinct. The database is set to empty. When the program runs, it sends a query to select students by ID zero. Because the program belongs to our DSL, we know that the value zero must originate from the input parameter S. So we rewrite the query as Q1 below. Because there's no data, the query retrieves empty. And then after that, the program terminates. From this execution, we need to choose from the four potential productions. We get rid of the empty production because the program was not empty. To choose from the three 
remaining productions, we ask, for, we ask about three executions of the program. Specifically, can we make Q1 retrieve zero rows, at least one row, or at least two rows? For reference, we call these three executions as zero, uh, E0, E1, and E2. From these three executions, we're going to choose the appropriate production. Conceptually, if we have two same executions, even though Q1 retrieves different number of numbers of rows, then it is a sequence. If we have two executions that differ after Q1, then it is a conditional that depends on the results of Q1. If we can make Q1 retrieve multiple rows and after that we detect some form of repetition, then it is a loop that iterates over the rows retrieved by Q1. For all of these to work, the DSL has restrictions in addition to the grammar. The restrictions basically say that the program should not contain repetitive queries that confuse us. Let's go back to the example. Here, execution E0 exists, and it is actually the previous execution we have just seen. Execution E2 does not exist because the query Q1 selects students by ID, and ID is the unique primary key of the table. So this query may retrieve at most one row. Execution E1 exists, and the execution looks like this. Now this time, we instead of using an empty database, we insert a record into the student's table, and we ensure that the ID equals the input parameter S. So now the database has a row like this. When the program runs, it first sends the same first query. The difference here is that it now retrieves a row instead of retrieving empty. The program then continues to send the second query, which retrieves empty. And then next, the program terminates. From this execution, we collected two queries. Let's look at all three executions side by side. We can get rid of the loop production because E2 was not satisfiable. Because E0 and E1 differ, we expand prog into, a, into an if statement that conditions on whether Q1 is empty or not. What this new hypothesis means is that the program first checks if the student S exists. And depending on that result, depending on that result, it does two different things. From this new hypothesis, we have more prog non-terminal symbols. For each of them, we are going to choose the right production and then resolve them recursively. In this process, we do not need to backtrack because at each stage, we expand only when we have enough information to uniquely choose the right production. A technical problem here is how to choose inputs. We encode paths in the hypothesis as quantifier-free SMT formulas, and then we solve for the inputs and database values to enforce the program to execute down certain paths. There are complications with dependency and ambiguity, and we deal with them in the paper. To recap, here are some key ideas of the algorithm. We rep represent the hypothesis as a DSL sentential form. We represent the hypothesis using active learning. Specifically, we resolve each prog non-terminal symbol with three executions. We use top-down recursion, and there's no need to backtrack. The DSL and the inference algorithm are designed together. The DSL associates control flow with query results, and it takes advantage of the traffic between components. In the paper, we present a proof outline for the soundness and completeness of this algorithm. Given any program in the DSL, we infer a correct program. Equivalently, we can split the sentence into two separate claims about soundness and completeness. We build a prototype implementation uh, for this algorithm and applied it to several practical applications. We inferred a subset of their functionality and synthesized new implementations in Python. Here are some numbers. As you can see, we take relatively few runs of the program, and we, it takes a, a realistic amount of time. 
the core functionality of these applications can be represented as relatively simple pro Python programs. Here's the related work. Compared to aut automata learning, we learn programs in our DSL and we don't need equivalence checks or counterexamples. Compared to Oracle guided synthesis, in this paper, they work with a different kind of components. They talk about how to synthesize a program by composing components in a straight line. We talk about inferring programs that are already built with components. Also, we have nested control flow and unbounded search space. This research was inspired by our previous paper, which deals with black box programs with maps. Here's the conclusion, and I'm happy to take questions. Hello? 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 How about now? So, uh, so from so in this paper, the apps we have, the 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 the, the Ruby on Rails apps were chosen to have core functionality that seem to belong to this DSL. They do have some additional features that are not in this DSL, like there are commands that do arithmetics, and we didn't try to infer those. Um, but I don't understand your like what specifically you're asking. Let me try one more time, uh, and then maybe we talk offline. Um, how close are you to being able to take a Ruby program and synthesize an equivalent Python program? And how much input, like, I'm just sort of asking just very black box, inputs and outputs of your process. Um, sort of how much of the semantics or behavior of the uh, input program comes out in the output program, and how much of uh, the semantics or behavior of the input program needs to be specified in the DSL? Um, so the input program is written in Ruby on Rails. It's not written in our DSL. It is, it is, it is considered, okay, if the application behavior is considered to be equivalent to another program in our DSL, then we guarantee to correctly and precisely infer the program and produce a new one. But we do not attempt to determine whether any program belongs to our DSL or not. Oh. That seems like the hard part. Actually, in this in in this system, loops are not the difficult part because we only deal with bounded loops that iterate over the rows of rows that were retrieved by a query, and the rows are observable in the database traffic. Okay. So if we can, so if the DSL has the the right restrictions, then we then detecting loops is essentially uh, consists of two parts. One is to force a certain query to return multiple rows. The other is how to detect repetition in the trace. 
So if we have the DSL design right, then that is not the difficult part. All right, so what is the hard part for Git channels, which is your one outlier time-wise? That's a good question. Um, so in the paper, we have a discussion about performance. And um, the performance bottleneck here is on ambiguous and long reference chains. Um, so basically, they're like if you don't like. So we were supposed to, we need to like when the solver returns, we are supposed to assign as distinct values as possible to different places, so that the trace is not ambiguous when you reference things. There's more detail in the paper, and I'm happy to take it offline. <laughs>